Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Rock. I'm director of the program in history and philosophy of science. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to this, uh, uh, to this uh, talk. Um, actually, we have a treat because we're going to have two talks, a short presentation, which I will tell you about in just a second, and a keynote by uh, Professor Numbers. Uh, I do want to mention that this talk is co-sponsored by the Program in History and Philosophy of Science and the Institute for the Science of Origins. Um, the Program in History and Philosophy of Science is an undergraduate major and minor. Uh, and uh, we welcome inquiries about the program. It's a joint interdisciplinary program conducted uh, collaboratively between the Department of History and the Department of Philosophy, and we're very excited about it. So the first uh, speaker uh, is a uh, sh short presentation uh, by uh, an undergraduate in our program. And uh, I think most people know that our SAGE's uh, general education program has a capstone event, and one element of the capstone is always supposed to be a public presentation of some kind. So this is the public presentation, a short presentation by one of our students. Her name is Sierra Chiwanga. And uh, she'll tell us a little bit, this is the title, I presume? Uh, yes. About um, artistic expressions in evolutionary biology. I'm a fourth year student here at Case, and my major is anthropology, but I have a minor in history and philosophy of science. So I decided to uh, tailor my Sage's capstone towards that minor. Okay. For my research, uh, Ernst Haeckel, a German biologist and advocate of Darwin's theory of evolution, represents the historical clash of producing scientific visions within the templates of self-expression and respective worldviews. This research will argue that and investigate how the perspective quality of the world and the authority of the individual imagination affect the representation and resulting interpretations of ideas in science. And I'm going to do this by analyzing Haeckel's illustrations in evolutionary biology. So first, you start with structuring nature as an artistic form. Illustrations were embodiments of scientific knowledge, and new aspects of nature were reviewed, revealed using scientific tools. Knowledge at the time was guided by scientific principles and methods, because in its older me meaning, science simply meant knowledge. And this knowledge was gained by observation of organisms. Some of the scientific tools included microscopes and photographs. So nature started being structured as an artistic form when artists decided to evaluate these scientific ideas and observations for aesthetic quality. You find, study, and illustrate these natural objects. So then beauty, style, and decoration were the lens through which nature was viewed, not just a microscopic one. So beginning with Haeckel's history and works, he was born in 1834 in what was then Prussia. And he read Origin of Species and really took to the concept of the variation of species. So in 1866, the general morphology of organisms appeared. Uh, in the 1870s, he illustrated monographs on individual nature forms. And in 1899, he published the first issues of Kunstformen der Natur. As an artist, he illustrated these processes and represented to the public, presented to the public representation of evolutionary biology. But this also poses the aforementioned class. Where does scientific vision and self-expression begin, begin and end when nature is structured as an artistic form? So some of the scientific illustrations I spoke of, if you notice uh, in the first picture, second, and third, you have hummingbirds, bats, and sea anemones. And what really struck me about these photos is uh, the symmetrical style and the expression of variation. If you notice, a lot of the species in this, oh, I'm sorry. A lot of the species uh, in these photos really don't look the same. Like for instance, the symmetry I'm speaking of, like for the hummingbirds, if you notice perfect V shapes for the wings and the tails. And if you notice at the very bottom right hand corner of the photo, you have two eggs. And then on the left middle side of the photo, you also have two eggs. And even in the middle, you see symmetry with the heads of the bats. And on the very right, you see many cylindrical forms with these sea anemones. And this really represented his own personal style in representing evolutionary biology. But how close are these pieces of artwork to original scientific observations? 
so for instance, he had ontology recapi recapitulates phylogeny. And this is the idea that development replays the evolutionary transitions of adult forms of an organism's past descendants. And this was brought out in 1866. Uh, so this is talking about embryonic development where its phylogeny is biological evolution. So in this picture, you see embryos of fish, salamander, tortoise, chick, hog, calf, rabbit, and human. Modern biology does not accept these literal forms to explain common ancestry, but in the 19th century, science did not discriminate this from actual scientific observations. So again, this brings the question of the influence of self-expression on representation. So getting to the core of my research, we're talking about the artistic interpretation versus the original message. Aesthetics involves understanding a reflection of the way things are perceived. So how does one convey the appropriate uh, message to generate the desired understanding of the public? For Heckel, nature actually merged with culture. This meant making Darwinian concepts more comprehensible to the broad public. So to do this, one must take into account the background and learning methods of one's audience. So at the time, even speaking with uh, other scholars on, on Heckel, he actually was able to publish and uh, actually promote his artist, artist work uh, much better than uh, Origin of Species by, by Darwin. Why? Because this visual, all these visual messages are really feeding more into the audience uh, rather than, say, reading, reading a book, like reading Origin of the Species. People took to the style much more, especially since it was of a more romantic style that was popular within that, within that time period. So that's how he really was able to generate understanding of his particular representation of these forms, uh, rather than, say, the true scientific observations that uh, encouraged him to draw these forms. So are you, do you, any of you have any questions as far as what, uh, what I was mentioning here? Any suggestions for, for further research? No, there's there's a statement, I don't know who said it, but I heard it quoted. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. You know, whether Heckel is actually drawing what he thinks he sees or he wants to see, or does he have an understanding that science under scientists studying morphology understand these in one way and he's rearranging them to communicate more easily the information to the public. I, I would have to say the latter of that statement. As a biologist, obviously he was able to observe these uh, species in their original forms. Uh, that's part of a science using observation to gain knowledge. However, as an artist, that's where he was able to use self-expression to express these forms to the audience. So his actual understanding, whereas his self-expression, are two different things. So you, you actually have statements by him or drawings that he did in the lab or drawings he did for publication to show to back up your two statements? Well, for example, with uh ontology recapitulates phylogeny. Obviously, when you're looking at the embryos that he drew, those aren't the same as, say, if you took an actual uh, photograph or, or looked through the microscope at an embryo. So I'm sure that with those resources that he had at the time, he understood what they really did look like. However, uh, representing them to the public, you had to use a different self-expression to really deliver the message of evolutionary biology. Okay. How was he received by other morphologists? Other morphologists, he was often criticized for his embryonic drawings. At that, actually later at the time, uh, many believed it, but then later on, especially the early 20th century, many started to criticize his drawings and, and saw them more or less as frauds. Yeah, at the time, there was l much less criticism uh, because, once again, you're really trying to deliver a message, and he tailored that message through the form of artwork to uh, his, his peers and uh, also the common audience. So um, his peers at the time were objecting strenuously to his particular explanation for evolutionary biology because they also, you know, being evolutionary biologists, had a different view of how it happened. 
and felt that he was uh, sort of co-opting uh, ontogeny to show his particular view. Is that what you mean? Definitely. Any other questions? Thank you very much. This forms a nice lead-in to our keynote talk this afternoon, which is by uh, a good friend and outstanding colleague, uh, Professor Ron Ronald Numbers. Uh, Professor Numbers is Coleman Professor of the History of Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and. Uh, to list the number of prizes and awards he's received would, would take far too long. Uh, i just mention one, which is two weeks ago at the annual meeting of the History of Science Society, uh, Prof Professor Numbers was given the uh, Sarton Medal uh, of the Society for Lifetime Achievement in History of Science. Um, uh, again, to enumerate his books, just, just his books alone uh, would take too long. Uh, those of us, those us lesser mortals, don't quite understand how he can uh, produce so many works of such outstanding quality. Uh, it, just to name three, uh, he's the author of The Creationists, Darwin Comes to America, and Disseminating Darwinism. Uh, we're very happy to have him here with us today. His title is Darwin's Legacy, Place, race, religion, and gender. Well, I'm very pleased to be back here in Cleveland uh, with you, although uh, I didn't gain anything in terms of weather. It's about as lousy here as it was when I left Madison, uh, Wisconsin. Um, and yes, I finally reached the age where I won a prize for lifetime. I guess everybody expects once you do that, you just retire and go to seed or something. I. Uh, do I need to turn anything on back there? I'm, I'm OK. OK, good. Well, I've been asked to speak about Darwin's legacy this afternoon. And I just wonder how many of you have any idea of how appropriate this afternoon is? Probably Patricia. This is the. 99th birthday of Darwin's Origin of Species. Uh, so I assume that you celebrate this day most years, and we'll have a really big blowout uh, next year for the uh, centennial celebration. Now, if you don't want to listen to anything more, uh, let me just sum up what I think Darwin's legacy was. It was substantial, but overrated. Now you can go to sleep. Let's first talk just a few minutes about uh, the scientific legacy. Because I think, uh, despite so much literature on the topic, uh, it's frequently misunderstood, even by some very good uh, historians of science. Darwin set out, as he later said in The Origin of Species, number one, to overthrow the dogma of separate creations, that is, to establish a theory of common descent. And number two, to explain what had happened largely but not exclusively by means of the process of natural selection. In writing to the American botanist Asa Gray in 1863, Darwin said, personally, of course, I care much about natural selection, but that seems to me utterly unimportant compared to the question of creation or modification, or did everything descend uh, from a common ancestor? Now, I think, just as a matter of common sense, that we ought to let Charles Darwin decide what was Darwinism. 
And that is the primary goal of Darwinism, his view, was to establish the notion of common descent. However, we have books such as uh, two by the historian of biology Peter Bowler that talk, one the title is The Non-Darwinian Revolution or The Eclipse of Darwinism. But he's talking about natural selection. He's not talking about Darwin's big goal of overthrowing the dogma of separate creations. If we take that as the heart of Darwin's achievement, then he brought about a major revolution and very quickly within about 15 years. He didn't do it all by himself. But within 15 years of the publication of Origin of Species, other biologists were referring to evolution as a scientific fact. There were a few holdouts around, but virtually all working naturalists had come to agree with Darwin. So an extremely powerful influence uh, in a very short period of time. Now natural selection was another matter altogether. I have found no American scientist in the 19th century who were what came to be known in the late 80s, 1880s, as neo-Darwinists. That is, who emphasized uh, natural selection and natural selection alone. Now, not even Darwin did that, so this shouldn't uh, have been surprising. Uh, and it probably wasn't until about the 1930s that a consensus was reached within the community of biologists that natural selection was doing most, if not all, of the heavy lifting in this process um, of evolution. Now, often uh, people associate Darwinism and Darwin's theory uh, with something godless and, in some cases, people think atheistic. But the first editions of The Origin of Species convey anything but that. Here's from two, two short passages from the conclusion of The Origin of Species. I believe, said Darwin, that animals have descended from at most only four or five progenitors and plants from an equal or lesser number. Analogy would lead me one step further, namely to the belief that all animals and plants have descended from some one prototype, but analogy may be a deceitful guide. Therefore, I skipped a few pages. Therefore, I should infer from analogy that probably all organic beings which have ever lived on Earth have descended from some one primordial form into which life was first breathed. And then in the second edition, he added, by the Creator. So people who wanted to take Darwin at face value and not give up their belief, could turn to this passage and another one very similar to it uh, a little bit later uh, at the end of the origin, uh, where he speaks of a creator with a capital C breathing life probably into one original organic form, but maybe four or five animals and four or five plants. This too makes it difficult to nail down exactly what should pass uh, as, as Darwinism, as we shall soon see. Now, just uh, four, years, four years later, uh, after revising uh, the origin to, uh, to add by the Creator, uh, in writing a, a letter to one of his best friends, Joseph Hooker, uh, Darwin said he already regretted 
that he had truckled to public opinion and used such pinnacle language he was. Whether he was sincere or not is a question I don't know that we'll ever answer, but by 63 or so, uh, he was regretting that he had been so open or so, uh, so religious in the way that he was uh, describing the origin of species. Now, his talk about a creator, as well as his inability to explain the variations on which natural selection worked, gave Darwinians or Darwinists some wiggle room to give their own spin to what Darwin uh, was trying to say. Let me just use two American examples. Uh, most of my examples will be from America today because I know more about America than I know about other countries. Uh, even before the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin had struck up a friendship and correspondence with the Harvard botanist Asa Gray, whom I've already uh, mentioned. And Asa Gray took it upon himself to provide what he called a fair hearing for Darwin's revolutionary ideas uh, in America. And Gray is often portrayed when he is presented in the context of the debates over Darwin as the purest of all the American uh, Darwinians. But Gray went only so far in embracing the teachings of his friend. In fact, in several areas he didn't go very far at all. So he said, I think there must have been a special origination for the first humans. Okay, so you move humans out of, out of this. By the time he died, uh, nearly three decades later, uh, he apparently had come to accept the evolution of the human body. But in the early years when he was fighting for Darwinism, he said he wasn't going to extend it to explain humans. And then, as he wrote Darwin himself, he says, I, I really like your theory. I think it explains lots of things. But complex organs such as the eye? You gotta be kidding. And Darwin confessed that even he had woken up in the middle of the night occasionally worried about uh, how his theory would do with, with complex organs. So again, Gray thought maybe a supernatural origination or a separate origination would be necessary for, for the eyes. And since Darwin didn't know where the variations came from, Asa Gray suggested that he might attribute those to divine influence and, and actually encouraged him to do this because not only did Gray think that's probably what had happened, that, that God had guided these variations in some way, but that it would make his theory uh, more acceptable to uh, theistic uh, readers of his work. Now, in 1868, in Variations of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, uh, Darwin publicly rejected Gray's view uh, and said, however much we may wish it, we can hardly, hardly follow Professor Asa Gray in his belief that, quote, variation has been led upon certain beneficial lines, like a stream along definite and useful lines of irrigation. So after, after 1868, uh, it was clear to people who were following uh, Darwin that he himself was moving away from any theistic uh, accommodation, although he never really uh, became uh, an atheist. One of Asa Gray's uh, good friends and collaborators was a congregational minister 
and amateur uh, geologist who did a lot of good geology, in fact traced the, the southern line of the, the glaciers in North America, uh, named George Frederick Wright. George Frederick Wright, since the 1870s down to the present, has been seen by contemporaries and by historians as one of the leading, quote, Christian Darwinists in America. One of the people who did some of the uh, best work uh, in trying to show that uh, Darwinism was compatible with Orthodox Christianity. Now, to write, being a Darwinist meant accepting the origin of species as it was originally written. So, unlike most people, Wright loved Darwinism, which allowed for the you know, the special creation, divine intervention whenever needed, as he said, and hated evolution. So you have one of the foremost Darwinists in America who is one of the strongest anti-evolutionists in America because he doesn't want to extend this process as, as some people, especially like Herbert Spencer were doing, to the entire cosmos and uh, write and others who considered themselves Darwinists uh, wanted to restrict Darwinism to solving the problem it had Darwin had originally set out to solve. That is, the origin of species, not even the evolution of species. Darwin never uses the word evolution in the origin of species. He does use the verb evolved once, I think. But. So it's not easy when we're reading about Darwin's legacy in the 19th century to determine just because somebody identifies as a follower of Darwin uh, how much evolution and how much natural evolution without God at all this person may have accepted unless they spell it out uh, for us. So in this area the legacy is a little bit uh, elusive. I've already touched a little bit upon religious responses. Uh, one thing we do know for certain, I guess, uh, is that Darwin destroyed natural theology. Now for the, those of you uh, who might not be familiar with natural theology, it's usually paired with revealed theology, and natural theology is deriving ideas about God's existence and character from studying nature. Revealed is getting your ideas about God from the Bible, and most people thought you could get them from both places. Um, but according to the great evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer, explaining the perfection of adaptation by materialistic forces removed God, so to speak, from his creation. It eliminated the principal arguments of natural theology, and it has been rightly said that natural theology as a viable concept died on November 24, 1859. So, we could come here to weep over, the, no, it depends on what your views are, I guess. Uh, now, Ernst Meyer was a great biologist, one of the greatest of the 20th century, probably. But he wasn't a very good historian, even though he wrote a fair amount of, of, of history of biology. I'm not sure exactly what he meant. He probably meant that natural theology that arguments derived from looking at nature uh, for the existence of God should have died on November 24, 1859. But 
you only need to spend a few minutes in the literature after that date to realize that natural theology remained alive and well and in many quarters down to the very present. Different people who believed in natural theology took different approaches, but one of the easy ones was if you accepted Darwinism, that is, that speciation and evolution generally occurred because of natural laws. It didn't take much imagination to say, okay, so natural laws created these very intricate mechanisms, maybe even the eye. But who made the natural laws? That was even more impressive. Somebody who could impose natural laws on the material world to produce these things, now that took a really powerful God to do that. So accepting Darwinism and Darwinism and natural selection uh, did not mean that you had to give up uh, natural theology. And many of the people who wrote the most about natural theology in the latter part of the 19th century were people who had accepted Darwinism or accepted evolution, and I'm using Darwinism now for common descent uh, primarily. Uh, many of those people were eager to show the compatibility between natural theology and Darwinism, Asa Gray being one of the most prominent, but there were many, uh, many others. So we really can't say anything that Darwin's legacy was to destroy natural philosophy. We have a, a, a parallel uh, uh, coming out of the 18th century when uh, philosophers who are about the only people who still read Kant and Hume, I guess, uh, say, okay, they destroyed natural uh, theology. And yet, William Paley and the Bridgewater Treatises come along to be bestsellers in the 19th century. Maybe, again, the logical underpinnings of natural theology had been knocked out, but very few people realized that, so natural theology uh, survived. You would think by now, with all the historians who have been working on the history of Darwinism and history of religion, that we would pretty much have nailed down Darwin's legacy uh, for religion. And I like to think that we've actually made some progress uh, in the last 25 or, or 30 years. But I'm not sure. In the late 1970s, a young ecclesiastical historian, very bright young American who had gone to Britain for his degree named James R. Moore, brought out a book called The Post-Darwinian Controversies, in which he explored the theological responses to Darwinism in England and the United States between 1859 and, and 1900. In it, he concluded that only those whose theology was distinctly orthodox, and, and this is a precise meaning of, of orthodox among Protestants, that is Calvinist. Calvinism is orthodoxy if you're not talking with Eastern Orthodox people. Uh, only those whose theology was distinctly orthodox or Calvinist could swallow Darwinism undiluted. And he argued that these people who believed in predestination, that God had created all these human beings, but only a few were predestined to survive, didn't have any trouble with this rather harsh worldview of Darwin's. 
where very few actually survived, and so they were compatible with it. Now, strangely, given what I've said, Moore's two strongest examples from the United States are Asa Gray and George Frederick Wright, both Calvinists, but hardly people who were able to take their Darwinism undiluted. You know, if you take humans and complex organs and variations out of the scheme, I think that constitutes toying with it just a little bit to make it go down uh, easier. But at least you had an argument, a target for other historians uh, to, to deal with after Moore's uh, fairly influential book. So Calvinists accept Darwin. Liberals like Unitarians uh, tend to, uh, according to, to uh, Moore, tend to want a more progressive, agreeable, neo-Lamarckian uh, form of evolution. Uh, and then you know, the conservatives just reject evolution um, altogether. But then a decade or two ago, an Irish historian of science and religion named David Livingstone, who not coincidentally happens to earn his living as a geographer, came up with a challenge to, uh, to Moore's interpretation. And as is the custom among geographers, Livingstone said, what Moore is overlooking is the importance of place. Place is crucial. Place trumps theology in helping us to understand this. And he said, let's just look at the Calvinist. For Moore, the Calvinists were one homogeneous mass, and they responded to Darwinism in this particular way, right? But Livingston says, if you look at Calvinists in different places, different geographical settings, you see divergent reactions. In Livingstone's hometown of Belfast, Ireland, there was a virulent anti-Darwinist uh, reaction, and Livingstone attributes that in large part to a lecture that the physicist John Tyndall delivered there in 1874, known as the Belfast Address. It was his presidential address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, in which, in so many words, Tyndall declared war on religion. And the next Sunday, every pulpit in Belfast went out after him and his cohorts who were trying to destroy, use science uh, to destroy religion. And that really poisoned the atmosphere for anybody who wanted to harmonize Darwinism. Now, I should add one, one other uh, sort of chronological uh, explanation here. There wasn't much of a religious response for the first 10 or 15 years because it seems that most religious writers theologians, ministers, and others thought that scientists weren't going to buy into this theory. It was too wild. There had been another book promoting evolution in the 1840s called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, and, and the scientists had laughed that off the stage. So the religious communities tended to think the same thing would happen. But by the early 70s, when a consensus, by which time a consensus he had emerged among scientists, uh, that common dissent was, was true, then the religious community started uh, feeling that they had to come to terms with this in one way or another, maybe rejecting it, maybe uh, modifying it, uh, maybe uh, accepting it. So the mid-70s, just when Tyndall gives his address, is the time when religious writers are starting more and more uh, to deal with this. 
I don't need to go through every Calvinist community that uh, Livingstone looks at, but he looks at Princeton, where you had a much more congenial uh, response. The president of Princeton actually tried to reconcile evolution and Calvinism. Uh, and then you had a Calvinist up, uh, the principal of what's now McGill University in Canada, was one of the leading geologists in North America, who was the last prominent geologist or biologist in North America to remain a creationist. He died in 1899. Uh, so there you had a very conservative uh, reaction. And then Edinburgh and Dunedin, New Zealand, Columbia, South Carolina, all hot spots, and Amsterdam all hot spots and and Livingstone uh, argues that uh, the the Calvinist response varied according to local conditions uh, and and culture so that there is no such thing as a Calvinist response and so we can forget that now if you take that too far it means we're not going to have any generalizations at all. Because along at the same time, Catholic historians who have been working on Catholic responses to evolution have been saying much the same thing. You can't generalize. Uh, Catholic responses in Argentina and Uruguay and in the United States and in Italy, France varied so much depending on local circumstances. Although the Catholic Roman Catholic Church is very hierarchical, with the Vatican up here, the Vatican wasn't either interested in for a, for a time or able to dictate what was going to happen uh, throughout uh, the Roman Catholic Church. About the only consensus you get eventually out of, out of the Catholics is that I can't think of a single Catholic evolutionist who doesn't insist and hasn't in the past insisted on the special origination of the human soul. But beyond that, it's, it's kind of uh, every Catholic for him or herself, I think. Um, now, if we want to nail down Darwin's legacy, maybe the best place to turn would be to a psychiatrist who could tell us how this notion that humans came from animals uh, might have affected uh, humans. Uh, and fortunately for us, Sigmund Freud, a famous psychoanalyst, actually talked about this. Uh, of course, primarily to set himself up as a hero. Uh, he wrote that human beings have suffered from three big blows to their self-love. One was with the Copernican Revolution, when we got moved from the center of the universe out to this planet that circles the sun, no longer central. Uh, the second was when Darwin showed that there was no difference uh, between animals and humans. And then third, when Freud himself uh, showed that uh, you know, human reasoning uh, was nothing really special. Um, you know, had more to do with your potty training than with God. Uh, of course, just on the face, historically, that's kind of a silly argument. Uh, although you still find some people writing about uh, how Copernicanism uh, moved humans from the center of the universe, but they don't realize that the center of the, the Aristotelian universe was the worst spot in the entire cosmos to be. That's where all the filth, as one writer, contemporary writer then said, that's the uh, excrementary part of the universe. That's the grossest, lowest, Humbly, nobody complained that they were being removed from a good place. It wasn't until uh, Newtonian physics replaced 
Aristotelian physics about a hundred years or more later, more, more than that, that people then say, oh yeah, you know, that was a terrible demotion. But at the time, nobody thought it was a demotion. It was a pretty nice thing. You get rid of, you get out of that cesspool uh, down there. Well, there were a number of people who thought, who worried about the demotion. Uh, a, uh, Charles Darwin used very graphic language in talking about uh, the, the ancestors of humans, you know, swinging in the trees. Uh, so there was no avoiding after he published The Descent of Man in 1871 that human ancestry was not something to brag about that much. And here you did have a huge choice because the, the traditional view was being created as perfect children of God, the image of God, and then kind of going downhill a little bit until you get to us and we're not so bad, or starting out with the worms and evolving up through the apes. Now that's, that's a huge shift in the way you view the history of, of life on Earth. And many people, probably the majority of Americans, were not willing to trade the idea that they were created in the image of God. We have, right today, 65.5% of Americans either believe in the special creation of the first humans or lean uh, toward that. That's a, that's a difficult idea for many people uh, to give up. But I'm not following. When am I supposed to finish? That's, that's not appropriate to tell me that. I'll just talk. Plenty to go to till about, when did you kind of half past? Okay, we'll, we'll try to do that. Um, and I was at but, and I was going on. Oh, despite having to give up this notion of being created in the image of God, unless, of course, you thought there was a special origination, uh, there's little evidence of people going through any psychological anguish over this. Very little. And you might expect, the people who are whining the most about this, and what a terrible demotion it was, and how, what an insult to the family, to say nothing of God, are the anti-evolutionists who aren't experiencing this, they're not buying into it at all. But the people who accepted this tended not to say much at all. In fact, it's very difficult to find people in the English-speaking world, anyway, whose religious convictions were destroyed because of accepting evolution. I've tried very hard, find one or two, but mostly people who lost their religious faith were like Charles Darwin. Now you would think if anybody's going to lose his, his faith in Christianity, it'd be Darwin himself. I mean, if evolution undermines Christianity, uh, he should have felt the effects of it. But according to his own testimony, he didn't. He talks about disbelief creeping over him at a very slow rate, uh, that he felt no distress, but he did end up almost certainly being an agnostic. In fact, that's the word he says probably describes his feeling. He didn't know. He, he didn't know whether there was a, a God. It wasn't that he had proved that there was no God, but he certainly abandoned Christianity uh, and was pretty iffy on theism uh, generally. But what happened to Darwin? Two personal experiences seem to have been crucial. And here I'm uh, relying on another book by James Moore that I trust implicitly. Uh, in the late 40s, Darwin's father died. His father was a physician 
beloved by people in the community, charitable man, but an unbeliever. And it really bothered Charles Darwin to think that if Christian theology were true, because his father had been an unbeliever, he would be forever burning in hell. That just seemed like a dastardly doctrine that he didn't want to buy into. And then through two and a half, three years later, his favorite child, his 10-year-old daughter, Annie, became gravely ill. Uh, Mrs. Darwin was pregnant uh, yet again, uh, and so Darwin uh, took Annie off to what was then called a water cure institution in England where he had benefited uh, some distance away from their home in Down and stayed with Annie, uh, and a governess type person too was, was there uh, until she died. And again, this just struck a blow at Christianity. Darwin said, if there is an omnipotent God who could have saved Annie's life, the best child he had ever seen, why wouldn't God want to do that? So it's for reasons like that, not because of evolution, that Darwin abandoned his belief in Christianity and came to question the very existence uh, of God. Uh, a number of years ago, a scholar named Susan Budd uh, was, uh, conducted a study of unbelievers, people who had given up their, their religious faith uh, from 1850 to 1950. Now, it's really hard to get good biographical material here. But she went to a, uh, the publication of a society of free thinkers. And when people would die, they would publish long obituaries explaining how they had given up their faith. And for, I believe it was 150 subjects she was able to find, only two, for only two, was Darwinism implicated in any way. People have been giving up their faith, but it's been more because of the, the sort of issues that Darwin faced or other similar questions, not because of evolution conflicting uh, with the scriptures. So the legacy there is that people have not suffered the psychological and religious anguish that we might uh, uh, have typically uh, believed. Now again, uh, uh, another part of the legacy is something that, that we might refer to as paradoxical. That is, that the more Darwinism succeeded in education and in the churches and in popular culture, the more of a backlash there was. So it's easy to see a fundamentalist movement appearing in the early 20th century, but not one with the intensity of the anti-evolution movement of the 1920s, which was a, a, a very, by then, a very important component, component of the fundamentalist reaction. Similarly, uh, after Sputnik uh, in the late 1950s, when the American government uh, decided to put a lot of money into improving uh, science education in America, and a few years later, the biological science, BSCS, Biological Sciences Curriculum Study textbooks came out, featuring, an evolu featuring evolution, finally, in the textbook. That, more than anything else, I believe, uh, prompted the creationist backlash in the 1960s. So we, we can see a legacy. Uh, it's not always a, a progressive legacy. In some cases, it's, it's anything uh, but that. Let me spend the last few minutes uh, looking at uh, 
Darwin's legacy for social thought, including racism and sexism and imperialism and laissez-faireism and a few other things like that. Every American history textbook that I know of has a section devoted, maybe only a few paragraphs, to something called social Darwinism. And it's a terrible thing. It's using Darwinism to justify all these terrible things that I've just uh, enumerated. Now, Americans typically didn't talk about social Darwinism before the 1940s when a very distinguished, very young at that time, American historian named Richard Hofstetter wrote a book about social Darwinism in American thought. And he used Darwinism to explain the prominence and robustness of all these things uh, in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries. The trouble is, that he was creating a straw man almost totally out of whole cloth. The, quest, the, the, the issue, I think, for the historian is to what extent did Darwinism influence social thought, whether racism, feminism, or any of the other isms that we could talk about. And here is where Darwin's legacy is just hugely uh, overrated. Start with American businessmen. We have an elegant study going back uh, three decades at least by a uh, University of Wisconsin historian named Irvin Wiley who wrote a book on self-made man in America and then an article, published an article looking specifically at the question, to what extent did free market American businessmen invoke Darwinism to justify their, their views, this competitive economic view of nature? And he said, well, maybe we could assume that the most likely occasion when they would do this would be when they were trying to impress Congress. So he looked at congressional testimony from American businessmen in the late 19th century, and surely there, if American businessmen were influenced by Darwin, they would have invoked the th authority of science. Total silence. Total silence. In fact, there are probably only like three or four four instances where a businessman ever mentioned the name Darwin or survival of the fittest. They didn't need Darwin and most of them didn't read Darwin or Spencer. Classical economics, if they wanted any theory, would be enough uh, for them. So to call this hardcore competitive economic world, a result of social Darwinism, seems to be totally unfair uh, to us and to Darwin both, uh, because, because it's, it's so wrong. Take a look at racism. People in the 19th century got plenty of justification for racism out of the Bible. They, they, it justified slavery, it explained the curse on Ham, which many of them accepted. Uh, I trust you know what I'm talking about. No? no? Anyway, I don't have time to explain. But the Bible talks about the curse on Ham. If you want to know about it, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, without turning to Darwinism. 
You know, there's an entire book on the sort of the Darwinian origins of racism at after 1859, uh, except that there are very few instances of people turning to Darwin to justify this. And what's even more interesting, not many African Americans were writing about Darwinism. But to date, nobody has found any of them blaming Darwinism for racism. And it wasn't that they were letting science off the hook. Well into the late 19th century, well past the coming of Darwinism, African Americans were much more concerned about something called polygenism. That is that human beings, the different races of humans had been created separately, which meant that they weren't all descendants of a common ancestor. I mean, here, the Bible and Charles Darwin agreed. I mean, the Bible has Adam and Eve, Charles Darwin has one, by implication anyway, one first human uh, couple. Uh, and so African Americans who were upset about science were attacking this polygenetic theory uh, at the time and, and not Darwinism. And later, uh, during say the early 20th century, uh, when this anti-evolution movement uh, broke out, as a historian named Jeffrey Moran has shown, the African American community was, was rather split. Uh, the most influential people in the African American community were the ministers. And they more or less lined up with the, uh, with the anti-evolutionists. Uh, they preached some mighty powerful sermons against humans descending from apes. However, the business community, the progressive business community and, and uh, publishers, they tended to support uh, evolution and Scopes, whom they saw as just a fellow victim of Southern white racism uh, somehow in the South. So you had a divide uh, in, in the 1920s. Uh, but with the, the even today, uh, uh, slightly more uh, African Americans support creationism than white Americans, so that there's still a, something of, of a tilt uh, there. Finally, a word about women and gender. If you've read your Darwin, especially Descent of Man and his ideas on sexual selection, uh, you'll know that Darwin was not uh, a great feminist. Uh, in fact, he talks about the inequality uh, of the sexes. And he published uh, this in 1871, uh, about the time that uh, a feminist movement was, was building up ahead of steam uh, in the United States. And some feminists felt that they had to respond uh, to what uh, Darwin was, was advocating. Um, and to avoid the biological determinism that Darwinism seemed to support. Now Darwin talked about inequality of the sexes, and it was clear by, I think it's clear by his examples that he, that he saw women being inferior, but he didn't describe women as inferior, just as, as, as not being equal. So you have a very small group of women uh, who are, are responding uh, to this negative implication uh, from Darwinism. But in a story that has only begun to be told, women tended to be very active anti-evolutionists. Um, the founder of what is now called Creation science was a woman in the 19th century. 
Perhaps more interestingly, in the 1920s, many of the men who spoke up against evolution said they were doing so for the mothers of America. And one observer said he thought that 70%, now this is a wild guess, but who knows whether it's right or 70% of the active anti-evolutionists during this period uh, were women. The problem is trying to find evidence, trying to find the voices of these women who opposed evolution. Uh, it's very hard to do. Uh, Jeff Moran, whom I've already mentioned, uh, tried at one point, gave up, and is now trying again. Uh, it's easier now uh, to do searches through newspapers. Uh, so uh, he may have luck uh, this time. Okay. Uh, I've provided, I think, enough examples uh, to, I hope, to convince you uh, that the notion that Darwinism had a serious impact on social thought in America uh, is just a gross distortion of what uh, of, of the very mild impact uh, that Darwin had. The group that was probably most influenced uh, by evolution, and in this instance it was the evolutionism of, of Herbert Spencer, was the, the emerging uh, discipline of sociology. They're about the only people really seriously interested uh, in this topic, and they're badly divided uh, even then. Thank you. Yes. You know, you sort of reduced Darwin into just uh, the issue of common descent. I'm not really sure that's fair. No, I didn't do that. Darwin did that. <laughs> well, I mean, if he says that natural selection is as nothing compared to that, that that's his. I mean, why would I be unfair to him when I'm just adopting his own take? I know, but I don't want to distort Darwin. I'm not asking you to distort Darwin. I'm asking you to deal with the complexity that's there, not simplify it to the point of ignoring the point of other implications. So, which one? Uh, well, there's a list, if you're interested, Kevin Hayden had a commentary in Nature not long ago, and he identified 10 different ideas that he thought were major contributions of Darwin's. And common descent and natural selection are among them, but there's a number of others, including the concept of due time. Uh, I'm sure Ernst Meyer would talk about. Uh, I mean, Darwin didn't do anything with deep time in terms of promoting deep time. That was well established when uh, when he started working there. I mean, he's picking that up from Lyle on the Voyage of the Beagle, so he shouldn't get any credit for deep time. He needed it, but he didn't. He didn't develop it. He did. Popularized it, yeah. But even Darwin wouldn't have taken credit for that. The question of taking all the credit for it. The point is, it was an essential part of his overall concept. Yeah. And, and the fact that his concept uh, has basically survived and done well, and as new evidence has accrued, that you know made that idea more palatable. So I mean, I, I'm not. I'm happy giving Lyell his share of credit, but. That doesn't mean Darwin gets not. Another issue that Ernst Meyer made a big deal of, uh, regardless of your view of Meyer as a historian, is the, the notion of population thinking, which I think is, is essential in his uh, set of ideas. And another to Darwin? Concept of ecology. There are examples from On the Origin of Species, which talks about the influence of one species on another. And I doubt that had been really thought through by very many individuals before Darwin. I mean, if you want, you could find people who thought of natural selection before Darwin. They had virtually no impact. See, I, I would turn the criticism around to you and say what I'm trying to get away from is what I consider a gross oversimplification of attributing almost everything to Darwin. Uh, you know, I just, I, I think he gets, He's the name that appears 
uh, for so much, we rarely go into the, into the science. Uh, it's just the Darwinian world or the Darwinian revolution or the Darwinian stuff. And the complexity that lies behind that is obscured in almost every textbook. And that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> I think his ideas, I mean, you have to distinguish between how much impact he had on various groups, most of whom didn't understand his ideas to begin with. Well, they were hard to understand because he was, he was a moving target. Sure, but who is it? What? Who is it? Well, me. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions? Yeah. Well, I was wondering, the quote that you gave for uh, when Darwin was writing Asa Gray, I think it was around 1860. Mm -hmm. 1863. Whether at the end of his life he assessed what he had done or what influence he had thought he had had or his ideas had had reevaluated. I don't have that type of quotation from the end of his life, but if anything, uh, he was taking more comfort in the fact. Uh, that he had uh, pretty much destroyed uh, the dogma of separate creations and was disappointed at a relative, relatively little impact of natural selection on the community. I mean, he was aware of that. And it was, as I said, it was, it was decades before people started rallying around him. Uh, around natural selection. Yeah, but I just thought it's interesting, your point of view here was to take off from what did Darwin think was important about yeah. his work, not this, the sort of to get a handle on, on this rather than dealing with this amorphous you know, buzzword that stands for so many uh, things. So I just wondered if, if he at the end of his life. Yeah, well, my other question is, how much does somebody like um, Agassiz really strike the popular imagination <coughs> more than Darwin? Agassiz's influence is, if anything, even trickier to assess. Because up until 1859, roughly, uh, Agassiz is a heretic, uh, a self described he thinks that's the way people are viewing him. He is very active in uh, tossing out any biblical references. He he's, has no use for, for the Bible as a source for natural history. And by about 1850, he becomes the most visible polygenist in America. So there go Adam and Eve. So he, he's tossed out Adam and Eve, he's tossed out Noah and the flood, he thinks that's the silliest thing. Uh, and then when Darwin publishes, he becomes a, a very prominent symbol of resistance to organic evolution. Uh, and church people seem to forgot, in their eagerness to find one scientific authority who questioned evolution, they seem to be willing, to, many of them, to give him a free pass. Uh, but then he, you know, he dies in the early 70s, so he's not around that, that long. Uh, and then future people, because he was an anti-evolutionist, some otherwise knowledgeable scholars talk about how you know, it was all, he, he was this because he grew up in a, in a Protestant minister's home. His father was a Huguenot minister. Uh, and that he was, couldn't escape from the Bible. The, Agassiz had nothing to do with the Bible. Uh, so uh, he really has a confused reputation. I mean, it just flips, the popular reputation pretty much flips in the, in the, in the early 60s. With um, the reaction to Darwin in America, that's all I know.
just just from <coughs> I may have heard that. No, I almost hate to ask this question, but um, John Carroll, I think, brought up making a report. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, Darwinism really uh, influenced like life saying go with them and not such a Okay, to what extent did Darwin uh, influence uh, Lysenkoism in Russia and Nazism in, in uh, Germany, probably? Okay. Um, well, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, Lysenko was uh, emphasizing certain theories that had been popular before Darwin, but some of which Darwin himself had, had utilized in, in the theory. They, they're always m described as Neo-Lamarckian. I don't know, they could be Neo-Darwinian too, because Darwin actually, right. Okay, okay. Neo-Lamarckian came into use before Neo-Darwinian. Okay. Uh, so, he didn't need Darwin, but that's what he was playing off against there uh, uh, in, uh, in promoting his deviant uh, biology. Uh, But, but Darwin didn't admire Marx. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, the German case uh, is, is a real hot potato today uh, and has been for about a century now. Uh, some of you may know a book by a guy named Weikert from the Discovery Institute. Uh, well, he was a senior fellow there, From Darwin to Hitler. And it's just a straight line, uh, you know, to the uh, gas chambers from Darwin's Origin of Species there. And he's a trained historian of science uh, who went wrong somewhere. Uh, there, there was a, a famous book that came out out of World War I uh, called Headquarters Nights. Now, this is World War I, pre-Nazi, uh, that had a great deal of influence uh, on both fundamentalists and biologists in America, is written by a biologist at Stanford, who had been over uh, in Belgium um, and had allegedly talked to German officers who told him how Darwinism had inspired their thinking about might makes right and survival of the fittest and all that. Um, and so for the fundamentalists who would keep throwing this up, this was, look what will happen. You know, look at to ethics, um, and and you had some biologists then in the 20s uh, trying to uh, rehabilitate evolution and emphasize cooperation that uh, that the Germans had misunderstood uh, Darwinism and especially its role in in, in human societies. Uh, now the 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 most obvious link that's being that's used all the time is is Darwin Heckel Hitler, uh, and I think uh, Bob Richards in his recent book on on Heckel pretty much puts that to rest. Uh, Heckel was a philo Semite rather than an anti Semite. He wasn't uh, he wasn't that embraced uh, by the the Nazis. It's uh, it just doesn't seem to hold up under really good historical scrutiny. Well, I think that you, you brought it around to the, to the first talk here, so... Uh, there, yeah, I did. Yeah. Thanks for asking that so I could do that. I think yeah. it's time to, to thank uh, Professor Numbers very warmly for a stimulating talk.
uh, one more element of our afternoon, and I'll, uh, uh, if Patricia Princehouse, Dr. Princehouse, has some uh, surprises. Yeah, you know, we have uh, various people who are writing some uh, trivia questions, right? Questions about this new science company. Um, and actually, while he's doing that, let me just uh, ask one more question here. Oh, what am um, I doing? So, uh, some time ago you wrote about the millennialists. Yeah. And I wondered uh, uh, what, you know, what, how you interpreted their actions today, how the, the, the views have changed since you wrote that. Well, it depends on which group you're talking about. If, if you're talking about millennialists who have put a date on the end of the world, they failed. So, thus, well, no, if it, they've already put an early, I mean, if they put on a date before today. Before today yeah. yeah, it doesn't mean they've given up hope, but, but they failed. But uh, they're extremely powerful. I mean, we almost had one in the vice presidency of the United States. Uh, who had the whole scheme worked out. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us about that. Well, Sarah Palin uh, is a Pentecostal uh, who believes in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation that predict the imminent uh, end of the world and then apparently has bought into um, uh, a rather uh, abstruse spin on this that there are special refugee places to go including Alaska which is not mainline Pentecostalism but uh, uh, it might help real estate values in Alaska if people start learning that that would be the one place you would want to be one of the few places you would want to be but uh, you know, these these people are very significant in keeping the creationist movement alive. They're not the only demographic behind creationism, but they're probably the most outspoken and enthusiastic. And not just Pentecostals, but fundamentalists and other conservative evangelicals. <laughs>